Hey all, for those of you who don't know me, I'm David. Um, I lead growth and customer success at Covalent, and I also host the State of the Union series um, with our ecosystem partners. Today, I want to introduce you to Rowan Stone, who is the director of on-chain BD at Coinbase and Base. Base is Coinbase's newest Ethereum L2, built on top of Optimism's open source OP stack. Um, it's completely permissionless to build on, and today Rowan's gonna be sharing some of the exciting new developments happening on this front. Rowan, it's great to have you here. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining, man. I really appreciate you. So um, before we get into base, I'd love to get started by asking about uh, your journey into crypto. So what were you doing before crypto and how did you get into this space? Oh, man. OK, I, I have a bit of an embarrassing past. I spent way longer than I like to admit in the energy and engineering industries. So I'm originally from Scotland. I live in mm -hmm. Panama City, Panama now. But in Scotland, there's really only one major industry and it's it's energy and engineering. So I work my way up from an engineer all the way up to eventually co-leading a kind of pretty large joint venture business as part of the exec team. And I absolutely hated it. It was a pretty solid career. Like I did pretty well over the course of about a decade, but every day waking up knowing that I'm kind of a little part of the problem just wasn't a nice feeling. And so a friend of mine told me to start looking at uh, some magical internet beams. And <laughs> I've been building computers and like faffing around with hardware and just having a ton of fun in the kind of gaming realm for quite a long time. And he basically said, look, you can point a couple of graphics cards towards this network and start earning magical internet money. It's like, cool, that sounds fun. So I, I faffed around for a little bit and I started earning you know, a couple of cents a day mining some Litecoin back when you could still mine Litecoin with a GPU. And uh, yeah, I got totally carried away, fell down the rabbit hole, ended up filling my spare room with graphics cards. Then I filled my office. Then I ran out of kind of space at home. So I filled my garage. And over the course of like 2013, 2014, 2015, obviously Ethereum came into the picture around about that time. It just became pretty obvious that like every time I added a new miner, it was scaling linearly in terms of like ability to generate revenue. And so I just took it as my exit. I was like, well, that's it. I don't want to be an exec in oil and gas land or in energy land. I want to kind of go in and give this a go. So I set up a company. I uh, bought a couple of warehouses, filled them full of equipment, kind of went all in and just thought, you know, I'll give this a try. And it was a ton of fun. Wow. Been here pretty a, much ever since. Yeah, that's a super uh, unconventional but interesting background. I mean, uh, crypto must be uh so exciting uh compared to like the previous industry you're in right it's i mean don't get me wrong e engineering and energy there is some fun problems to solve there like it's not the most boring place in the world but i just didn't feel like i didn't feel i was making anything better you know what i right. mean mm -hmm. like it's this kind of like cheesy thing to say but you want to wake up and feel good about what you do and you want to wake up and feel like you're making a difference in some way shape or form and I kind of felt like I was a detractor rather than somebody that was making things better. So that was my entrance. Yeah, it, it was it was a ton of fun. I've actually still got, you might notice up here, one of my first Bitcoin miners from like 2014, wow. I think. So I think that's an S3 plus, if anybody knows anything about the Bitmain miners. Um, so yeah, that's like my souvenir. It's pretty much the only piece of the mining business that's left. Um, and after that, I don't want to go on a tangent here, but I ended up with a couple of friends helping launch and grow uh, a crypto project called Zencash originally. That kind of morphed into Horizon, ticker symbol Zen, which is actually listed on Coinbase. Um, and then we spun off like a labs entity in very much the standard way that most of the crypto companies do now. And that was called Horizon Labs. And uh, that was like a software development type business. We did a ton of cool stuff. Probably the most, I guess, recognizable thing that business did was create the ape token for Yuga. Um, and then from there, just kind of fell down the rabbit hole of DeFi stuff, did a bit of VC work, did a ton of work around kind of DEX aggregation. And then that's what took me here eventually to Coinbase. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, interestingly, we uh, also are partnered up with Horizon, uh, indexing and supporting their uh, EON chain. So it's a very cool industry. Uh, but yeah, speaking of Coinbase, can you talk a little bit more about your background inside Coinbase, uh, especially as the director of on-chain BD? I mean, that's a super uh, interesting title. Yeah, I have to. I, um, I joined two years ago now uh, via an acquisition. And 
my initial kind of role was pretty fluffy. I think they just sort of saw me as someone that had been in the space for a while, had a decent amount of experience in kind of operations and business development. And so someone that they should just try and keep around in some way, shape or form. But I didn't really have a well-formed role. Um, and I was kind of doing a mixture of BD work and special projects and anything that was a little bit funky and crypto native. Mm -hmm. And then from there, kind of slowly found myself uh, into my current role now, which is heading up uh, an awesome team of people we call the on-chain BD team. Mm -hmm. um, we basically look after all of the partnerships and relationships and initiatives within the kind of on-chain realm. So that's everything in the kind of DeFi space, everything in gaming and creative, um, governance and social, as well as uh, kind of infrastructure type things, staking type things. And then we also look after some of the specific Coinbase products that are more on-chain or kind of crypto forward. Things mm -hmm. like uh, Coinbase Wrapped ETH, liquid staking token. We do a lot of the business work for USDC. And most topical for today, we're kind of the business and operations lead for base, Coinbase's layer two. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um... I think uh, what's interesting about Coinbase is that, you know, the future is becoming more and more on chain and Coinbase as a company is also shifting uh, around that insight. So it's been super awesome to see Coinbase evolve and develop all these um, awesome uh, products such as Base. Um, talking about Base, uh, how do you feel about actually not Base yet, but um, how do you feel about Coinbase's role in the crypto ecosystem as a whole first uh, before we dive deeper into Base? Coinbase has built, in my opinion, the kind of strongest and slickest fiat to crypto product. And mm -hmm. I kind of view it as a bridge, like it's built a business around being a bridge from the fiat world into the crypto world over the past decade or so. And that's like the core of the business. Mm -hmm. And because of that, Coinbase is playing like a really pivotal and key role. And aside from the kind of fiat to crypto bridge, the work that Coinbase is doing to kind of stand up, if you like, for the industry and ensure that we can achieve sensible regulation that doesn't hinder progress, but instead enables and accelerates kind of adoption and I guess just safety and security from a user, consumer and builder perspective so that people feel more comfortable about engaging with this new technology. I think that piece of work that, that we're collectively doing now is critically important. And mm -hmm. something that I'm super proud to be a tiny, tiny, insignificant part of. Um, but really, the way we're viewing things now is that bridging from the kind of fiat world to the crypto world, if you like, kind of bringing people from their dollars or their pounds or their euros into kind of Bitcoin or ETH or USDC, that's, that's going to be bread and butter for a very long time. But mm -hmm. really, part of the aim here is to start bringing people, builders and consumers on chain as much as possible. So not just being a bridge from fiat to crypto, but also being a bridge from kind of centralized Coinbase land where you have a custodial wallet and you're able to do a bunch of different things with that into a world where you are using a self custody wallet, or maybe it's a multi-party computation wallet, like an MPC type solution, where it's, I guess, kind of shared custody, if you like, um, and enabling people to kind of engage with this next wave of innovation and all the really cool things that people are building in the on-chain world. And so mm -hmm. base is kind of a big part of that effort. And I'm sure we'll end up talking about this in more detail, but at a super high level, if we want to bring tons of people on chain, like if we want to have real consumer adoption, there's a lot of friction that we need to remove. And that's really yeah. where we're trying to hone our energy and hone our attention. Uh, and for me, like really simplistically, crypto is still way, way, way too complicated. Like trying to okay. explain this to somebody that hasn't lived and breathed it for the past few years or decade or whatever, it's not easy. And, and onboarding to a wallet, even onboarding to like an exchange, it's akin to onboarding to a new bank. Like it takes time, there's diligence, there's KYC, there's lots of like hoops to jump through. And so we need to do a lot of work to make it easier to onboard people into crypto. And there's technologies like kind of NPC and account abstraction and things like that that can make that easier. And then on the other side, the other big barrier in my view is that it's still way too expensive. Like we're in a bear market still. We're kind of seeing green shoots of growth with kind of ETF hype and kind of pre halving hype and things like that. But ultimately, we are still in a relatively long term downtrend. And mm -hmm. even now, transactions are super expensive on layer one. And again, mm -hmm. base is kind of a big part of that 
how do we bring affordable, reliable, secure block space to market for builders and for consumers so that we can enable this kind of next wave of, of applications in a way that isn't going to cost people 20, 30, 50, 100, $500 per transaction. So mm -hmm. a really big part of that kind of next unlock. Yeah, I mean, uh, Coinbase is certainly heading in the right direction. Uh, I personally feel like it's becoming more and more on-chain native uh, with each passing day. I mean, I think uh, yesterday I just read a tweet from Jesse that every new Coinbase engineer now uh, goes for a full on-chain curriculum and hackathon. So uh, you guys are definitely uh, going, taking things in the right direction. And um, that's actually a great segue into what I wanted to touch on next. Uh, why don't we kind of shift gears and talk about um, BASE? Uh, could you kind of give us a brief overview of BASE? I mean, you touched on it a little bit li uh, earlier, um, but also in general, what uh, BASE uh, aims to achieve uh, as a L2? Happy to. And I think we should start with what we're aiming to achieve. And super high level, like our cornerstone here is to bring a million builders and a billion users on chain. And whenever I say that, I kind of have this double-edged sword where I'm like, that sounds really lofty. And when you put it in those terms, it's really not very much. A billion people sounds like a lot. And if you'd asked me that five, six, seven, eight years ago, I would have thought you were absolutely mental. But I think where we are today and where the technology sits today, we've got most of the pieces that are needed to really lock mass adoption. And so it doesn't feel as scary anymore. We're charging head on to build the best possible developer platform with reliable, affordable block space so that we can get a million builders and a billion users on chain. And not like in the next decade, like we wanna have this done in the next kind of three to five years. And that has to be the aim. And so what is base? Base is a layer two. When we say layer two, we simply mean it's like a, uh, a scaling solution, if you like, that's built on top of layer one, layer one being Ethereum. We chose to build in the Ethereum space because that's really where the vast majority of development and kind of exciting new things are being created. And so we wanted to be a part of that ecosystem and not kind of be a silo kind of new layer one off to the side. Although we did explore every available option, obviously, in a lot of detail. And uh, you mentioned Jesse. Jesse is, is the man who has been spearheading this entire mission. He's the man that spearheaded the team to figure out the right way to start bringing Coinbase initially on chain and having like a home for Coinbase so that all of the engineers and engineering talent that we have have somewhere to kind of throw their energy. Um, and so at the end of that effort, as I mentioned before, Base is a layer two built on Ethereum. It's if anyone doesn't know kind of how these things work, it's essentially like a transaction bundling type uh, tool. And the reason that we do that is to get economy of scale so that rather than paying 10, 20, 30, $50 per transaction on layer one, we can kind of bundle all of these layer two transactions together. We can publish them back to layer one in a way that's still secure. And we can drastically reduce the cost of individual transactions on the layer two. And so the way we stand today is that transactions on base are kind of in the region of five to 10 cents. Uh, maybe we'll touch on this a little bit later. I won't go into too much detail now, but our objective is to get that down subset as quickly as physically possible, because for us, that's really going to be one of the primary drivers to unlock real kind of scaled adoption. Nobody's going to use this stuff if it's 10 bucks per transaction. Like we need to get this down to the point where users don't notice it or mm -hmm. builders, be them individuals or large companies can cover the cost of gas for the user so that they don't even need to think about it. So mm -hmm. that's kind of where we're, we're aiming. And I'll pause there because I kind of went on a bit of a tangent. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's a super smart move for base to be aligned uh, on the EVM as the toolkit. You know, Ethereum has a L1 to settle on and also the OP stack uh, as the L2 that you're, you're building these apps and bring in the users. And uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, your goal is to uh, bring a billion, uh, a billion users on chain and a million devs on chain. So a million devs on chain, and then that will bring in a billion uh, users. Is that internally the North Star metric that you guys are optimizing for and going for? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're building transparently and we're building in community. So I don't have any concerns kind of being very open here, but that is absolutely what we're aiming to, to achieve. And there's a ton of friction. Like, this is not an easy thing to do. 
there are not a million builders in the crypto space today on mm -hmm. all of the chains put together. So this is bringing a ton of net new developers from outside industry in, in a way that is scalable in a way that they kind of have certainty that they can create viable businesses, viable on-chain products, because ultimately that's what needs to happen. Like people aren't going to come and throw their resources, be them time or, or capital into something if they don't believe they can kind of make it a viable business. So a big part of this is working and collaborating with reputable builders that are already building really cool things to kind of show the world what's possible and to kind of demonstrate the utility and the value that this tech stack can bring. And I don't mean this tech stack specifically OP stack or specifically base. I just mean crypto in general. And I think talking about that for a second, it's worth noting that we don't really mind where these million builders build and where these billion users decide to kind of be. Obviously, it would be awesome if we could have as many of them on base as possible. Like, clearly, that's what I'm most interested in. Hmm. But ultimately, it's about growing the pie here. Like, we want to see crypto succeed. And so we just want to bring a million builders into the crypto space as a whole. And we want to see a billion users in the crypto space as a whole. And this is one of those things in life that where you set yourself a goal and then you achieve the goal and you immediately create a new one. Like, that for sure has to be the kind of aim here. A billion users is not the end game, but it's a yep. great first step. Absolutely. No, I love this uh, visionary uh, kind of statement that you guys have internally uh, and that you guys have been repeating. Um, you know, I think Coinbase already has 110 million verified users and, uh, you know, 80 billion assets. So it's nice to be able to kind of bridge that into the on-chain world. And I feel like base is kind of like that perfect stepping stone, right, to explore the broader crypto economy and also bring demand from real users uh, into the on-chain world. Um, but uh, why don't we talk a little bit more about uh, on-chain summer? So I know Base had this super fun uh, go-to-market called on-chain summer. It ran for the entire month of August. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how your team came up with that? And you know, now that on-chain summer has ended, how you guys can continue to effort? Absolutely. So launching a new chain is a fairly apocalyptic effort in terms of like coordination and outreach and business development and all those types of things. Because if you just rock up with a new chain and press the on button and you haven't done the legwork to kind of drive builders to actually deploy so that there's some utility, there's going to be zero activity. Mm -hmm. And so we spent a long time working with all of the kind of names that I'm sure everybody here has heard a million times, including yourself to ensure that lots of kind of reputable builders were able to deploy applications. And when you take a step back and think about like the sequencing here, if we think about it in terms of verticals, gaming, it's going to take time. Mm -hmm. Net new games take a lot of development time. The cycles are long. You could port a game from one chain to another, but realistically, you want to see net new cool stuff. And so that's going to take time. So going to market early with gaming, not really massively viable. DeFi has tons of complex interdependencies. We can really simplify them down into, you need to have good on-chain liquidity as your kind of core building block. And then you need to have good oracles so that you know the price of these assets. And then once you have good on-chain liquidity and you have an ability to determine the price of these individual assets, you can start using them to build cool things. Um, DeFi being kind of, or I guess, borrow lend within DeFi being the main application. So like your Aves, your compounds of the world. But it takes time to build up the liquidity. It takes time to build up the borrow lend capacity. It takes time to have oracles spun up. And so again, going to market with DeFi didn't make a ton of sense. And fast forwarding a little bit, rather than going through every single thing we couldn't do, the creator space for us is very likely to be what actually starts to bring people on chain in a meaningful way. Like clearly crypto's main product market fit is like an ability to own something of monetary value and mm -hmm. send it anywhere in the world without a bunch of intermediaries. Like we all know this, we've all said this a million times. So finance is a key part of like that unlock for adoption, but the traction that we're seeing in the creator space through other different verticals within creators from kind of art to collectibles, to music, to loyalty and rewards, 
Like you can't ignore that. And we firmly believe that that has huge power to unlock a big chunk of the adoption that we're aiming to see. And so because we can spin that up much faster, we decided to go to market in that realm. Chain Summer was basically aiming to create a kind of on-chain festival of sorts, celebrating all of the cool things created by a ton of big companies, a ton of individual creators. And the idea was simple. It was like, let's do one drop per day where every single day when someone logs in, there's something fun that they can engage with, something fun they can mint. And it just gets people using this stuff, forces mm -hmm. people to like, okay, I need a wallet if I want to collect this cool thing. I'll go get a wallet. Okay, now I'm hooked up and I understand how to connect my wallet into onchain summer.xyz. I really want this. I'm going to mint it. I need to go and source myself some funds. So it was a cool way of kind of bringing people on chain and super successful. We saw millions of mints across the kind of uh, three week period. And I think we saw something like seven or 800,000 mints just exactly on chain summer, like on the native site. So very successful it kind of gave us an ability to point to something and say like on-chain is here, it's here yep. now and it's useful now. And I think that key piece going back to something I said earlier is really useful in the mission that we have on the Hill to kind of persuade government and regulators to give us sensible regulation mm -hmm. because now we can credibly state or we can have a bit more of an argument that crypto isn't all speculation and there is actually tons of cool activity and cool utility being driven by creators and musicians and et cetera, et cetera. So really fun initiative. It was a ton of work to put together and a bit of a plug. We're kind of continuing something similar, something called on-chain daily. And the mm -hmm. idea here is very similar. We want to ensure that there is something interesting for users to do or see on as frequent a basis as possible. And we're collaborating and partnering with some really cool creators, platforms and builders it as best we can and give them a little bit of limelight and a little bit of attention so well worth looking out for if you check out our twitter which is just build on base uh, you'll see on chain daily tweets relatively frequently highlighting like the the next thing to take a, a look at yeah i definitely think uh base mainnet is one of the most successful uh, chain launches of the year and you know i loved on chain summer i participated every day and it really just showed that you know the culture uh, the creators and the builders are still here you know despite the bear market and i loved how you know every day it showed that there was different utility um for the different tools we have in crypto so uh kudos to your team um i just want to run through a couple of stats real quick that we have here at covalent on base and how quickly uh, base has been growing so you know after on-chain summer uh daily active addresses on base is now over a hundred thousand a day um transactions per day is nearing uh, over a million um, that puts you guys, you know, uh, on a per day basis, more TPS than any other L2, more TPS than Ethereum itself. Um, so, you know, on-chain summer has definitely worked. How has it been seeing kind of base popping off like this since uh, on-chain summer and mainnet launch? I think I have to kind of temper expectations a little bit here. Uh, we did achieve higher TPS than Ethereum for about a week. Mm -hmm. um shortly after on chain summer but it's since kind of started to reduce a little bit like these things all ebb and flow i think the launch hype clearly gathered the attention of a ton of different people like friend tech did spectacularly well in the early days they basically got the entire of crypto twitter on base on friend tech in like a couple of days super awesome to see um so we're not quite that crazy right now but we have seen really good traction it's stabilized at a really impressive level and it's really good to see, but you know, we don't want to get too ahead of ourselves here. We are essentially still in that zero to one phase mm -hmm. and we're starting to pivot from the zero to one phase in terms of like actually turning this stuff on to now like, okay, how do we go from one to a hundred? How do we scale this? How do we fix the friction points? How do we make this the best possible place for builders to build? And how do we just make this the kind of default solution for users that would be transacting on chain? So mm -hmm. all that to say, we have a ton of work to do and, and we're hungry for it. We're going to make it work. Awesome. Yeah. It's uh, been super cool to see all these uh, new consumer use cases pop up, uh, pop on, on base. Um, so like, you know, base paint is one, uh, friend tech has been the talk of the town. 
what are your thoughts on uh, these new consumer use cases on base and especially on Frentech since everyone's been uh, talking about it, using it? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that uh, internally as a team? Love it. Uh, love the innovation, love the speed at which they're iterating. Like the first mm. time I opened the Frentech app, you could tell they just posted something that was like polished and nice and usable. But like they tried to get to market quickly and that was mm. really smart. And they managed to get something to market quickly that although not perfect was like really usable. But even just in that first kind of two to three weeks, every time I logged in, there was like a new button, a new layout, a new feature, a new something. Really, really impressive to see, iterating fast. Base paint as well, absolutely crazy cool. If anybody hasn't seen these things, just really quickly, Friend Tech is like uh, an on-chain social kind of, I guess, message board where you own your own space and you're able to kind of monetize access to that space. So for example, if you wanted to speak to, I don't know, I'm just going to pull someone, Kobe. You want to have a chat to Kobe, he's not going to answer your DMs because his DMs are closed. He's got a, a, a space in Frentech. You can buy a kind of key or a share. They've renamed it a couple of times. I don't know exactly what the right term is. But you buy access to his room, and then you're able to chat to him. So for a user, you're able to get access to people that you otherwise wouldn't. And for someone that has a bit of a following or somebody that wants to grow a following, you're able to directly monetize that, which is really, really cool. And then Base Paints is like a collaborative, I guess, art project, excuse me, where Every day they have a theme and you rock up and everybody can contribute to like a communal mural. And then at the end of the time period, that mural becomes an NFT and you can mint it. Super simple, really elegant, really fun. There's been a ton of cool things come out of it. Well worth a look. But love to see these things. Ultimately don't know in which direction people are going to go. And that's kind of what's so exciting here. Like we want to just be as general purpose as we can. The kind of mantra we've been pushing is that base is for everyone. It's not mm -hmm. like a DeFi chain. It's not a creator's chain. It's the general purpose, affordable, reliable block space. And if we can know that, we're going to see a ton more of these friend tech base paint type new applications come to market. Yeah. I think the best part about these uh, consumer apps is like, it's bringing actually a lot of uh, normies, uh, what we call them in crypto, uh, onto base and on chain. Like uh, a bunch of my friends um, got on chain because of on chain summer. Um, they know about friend tech, they know about base paint. Um, so it, it really feels to me like we're at kind of an inflection point where we're seeing real consumer use cases um, that aren't speculative, that actually have the potential to bring in uh, billions of users. And uh, that gets me uh, really fired up. And um, Another project that I actually really liked on base is a smaller project um, called OnChain Hats. So I was actually able mm. to mint uh, OnChain Hat as an NFT on base, and then they shipped me uh, an actual physical hat. So this is what I got. Uh, so this is another example of an actual consumer use case that has utility and that actually makes uh, the user feel like, you know, this is something useful and not just, you know, a crypto pump, you know, uh, price go up, uh, speculative thing. I love it. I have quite a few of the on-chain hats myself. I think they're ace. I actually haven't burned the NFTs to get the hats shipped though. So thank you for the reminder. Like I need to go and get that done today. Uh, but yeah, got, I think I got the, I got the base one. I got the on-chain one in a couple of different colors. And I think there was like a limited one that was super limited that I couldn't resist. I just had to have it, but love to see this stuff. Super, super yeah, cool. the good news is you won't even have to burn your NFTs. Uh, the NFTs act as a, a kind of it, the 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 online store is token gated. So once you, ah. you know, log in your wallet and it shows that you have the NFT, um, it's just free. Uh, the hat becomes free. It's free shipping, and it just get, gets delivered to your door. Doesn't get any better. Yeah, Although, doesn't get any. <laughs> pretty sure they're not going to ship to Panama, but I'll figure it out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, worst case, uh, you can have a trip to me, and when we meet up in uh, Dev Connect or something, I can hand it over to you. <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so let's uh, zoom out a bit, and um, you know, now we've spoken about Coinbase and also Base. Um, let's kind of put everything in context here. So, um, you know, to a lot of people, it kind of seems like Base, in a way, is like uh, Coinbase's legacy, right? right? Making crypto even easier to use and uh, bringing the on-chain world mainstream. So. How do you think Base really complements Coinbase's existing products? And um, internally, 
uh, how do you guys view base, uh, you know, relative to all of these other products that you guys have? I know there's a pretty good synergy and the end to end user experience here that uh, it'd be cool for you to talk about. I really view base as like glue between all of the different disparate products that Coinbase currently has. Like we've been building a variety of different builder tools, institutional kind of offerings, kind of standard prime type stuff. So like custody and trading, things like that. And then we obviously have the core exchange and all of these things touch the on-chain world in some shape or form. Mm -hmm. They've all previously touched 50 different chains. Like that's just the way the industry has been building. And I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but that's kind of part of the reason why I'm so excited for base, because it's like us taking one step towards some level of standardization by building on the OP stack, which is fully open source and MIT licensed. And for anyone who doesn't know, it's a toolkit to enable deployment of layer twos. And why is that exciting? Well, in a world where we build 50 different chains in 50 different directions, if you try and onboard your neighbor and you're trying to show them the top 10 applications, they're probably all on different chains. And that means that the person needs to use lots of different block explorers, and they might even need to use lots of different wallets. I'm like, that's just the worst user experience ever. And mm -hmm. so pushing people to, or not pushing people, but rather elevating a particular standard and accelerating the development of that standard, like making it as secure as possible, as centralized as possible, as open as possible, as quickly as possible, uh, is taking a step towards enabling builders to build on a shared technical standard. And doing mm -hmm. that gives us the kind of roadmap towards interoperability. And for me, interoperability is probably one of the biggest unlocks that we can have to get towards that consumer adoption. And it's a terrible analogy, but I like to make it anyway. The internet would not have worked and would not have taken off the way it did had we not all very early on agreed to use the same standard, like TCP IP, for example. Imagine a world where there was 50 different versions of TCP IP. Like it just, it wouldn't work. There's, there's no realm in which that makes sense. So getting back to your question, um, base really for me is like a glue between these lots of different things. We have things like commerce, we have things like pay, which is an ability for a DAP to integrate our fiat rails directly within their front end. We have um, wallet, obviously, our core exchange, prime institutional offerings. And what you'll see over the kind of coming months is a standardization within Coinbase to kind of have base as just be the default solution so that when a user is sending or receiving or anything along those lines, they're doing it at the cheapest possible price using block space that's reliable and affordable. And it's obviously not a case of like removing other functionality and, and elevating base. Like there will always be an ability to use the chain of your choice. Like that's the right way to do these things. We want to make sure that users have a consistent and easy experience. We want to make sure that these things just work together. And a great way to make sure they just work together is having like clear technical standard and interoperability between all the things. So for me, base is a way for us to really have an offering that is fully verticalized and touches every part of the dev stack. We can now go to a potential builder or a consumer, offer them every piece of the puzzle that they need to really start engaging in the on-chain world and building an application or a product, or even just creating a kind of alternate version of what they have today in the on-chain world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, Base is kind of like that perfect uh, on-chain native first stop for users, um, you know, for the next billion people that comes into the crypto space, uh, you know, from off-chain, I think there's a good, uh, you know, flow here that, you know, they go to Coinbase to get their crypto and then to Coinbase wallet and then to Base, which will support them to kind of go everywhere and explore uh, other ecosystems. Um, you also brought up the OP stack earlier, um, which is you know one of many ecosystems within uh, the crypto space and within the Ethereum realm. So, uh, how did your team decide and choose the OP stack as the best way um, to scale base and also to scale Ethereum? Yeah, so we've talking of scaling. Um, we've been working on something called EIP four eight four four for quite a long time, uh, like well over a year at this point, and it's actually agreed for the next Ethereum fork. What EIP 4844 does is carve out allocated block space on layer one called blobs. Mm -hmm. 
for layer twos. So when I say layer twos, I mean OP mainnet, Optimism's chain, I mean Arbitrum, and I mean base. Um, and yeah. so these three chains after implementation of 4844 will have way more predictability in terms of the cost to publish transactions back to layer one. And they'll be dedicated kind of availability, so there'll be a bit more capacity. And ultimately, this will enable us to collapse transaction prices on layer two. So when I mentioned earlier, we want to have transactions down subsent. This is the path to get us there. It's not going to happen overnight. Kind of the instant improvement is maybe going to be like a two to four X. So rather than being kind of like five to 10 cents, maybe it will be like two to three cents, something like that. And then over time, as we continue to improve and develop, we'll get that right down subsent. Um, but that effort was done between Coinbase, Optimism, and Arbitrum. And the mm -hmm. work we did with Optimism kind of just let us realize how cool the team are. Like we really enjoyed working alongside them in terms of kind of high level thesis and high level thinking. We're really aligned in terms of how we get mass adoption. And so when we were evaluating lots of different technical solutions, that was obviously a contributing factor. Um, mm -hmm. One of the key reasons that we went with Op Optimism is that they are building in community. They're building fully open source. And Coinbase is essentially a giant centralized company. Like we are a public company. So having that kind of counterbalance for a very decentralized organization that's really good on governance to kind of counterbalance Coinbase's centralization and to kind of help us in areas that we're not so strong, while we can also help them in areas where they aren't so strong. We have a ton mm -hmm. of engineering talent, like their engineers are incredible. Let's be very, very clear. But we've been building and scaling Coinbase for a decade and making it as secure as physically possible for a decade. So we can bring some of those learnings into that realm and help mm -hmm. accelerate OP stack to make it completely decentralized and to make it more secure by bringing things like fraud proofs to market. So short version, got on really well with the team. Their toolkit is fully MIT like and open source. Um, we'd done work together previously, so we knew there was a good gel there, and it just became a logical choice when we looked at the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, how, how cool is it having a Fortune 500 company that has an agreement with the Optimism Collective, which is a DAO? Uh, and then I know you guys are also, um, you know, a core contributor in OP Stack, and I heard that there's going to be a revenue share uh, from base back to the Optimism Collective to continue to fund public goods. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that? Happy to. The deal with Optimism is probably the most fun arrangement I've ever put together. And working with their team was just the best. They're a really cool bunch. We were very aligned. And for us, it's important that whatever we're doing is sustainable. And for these to be sustainable, there needs to be funding. And so we don't want to just be extractive here. We very early on decided that if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. We're going to be joining as a core contributor. What does that mean? That means we're going to really put our engineering mites in, in action and have them help accelerate development and have them really lean in and be part of that org um, so that everything that we build for base, everything that we kind of help or improve, all of that goes back to the OP stack, Optimism mainnet benefits, all of the other OP stack chains benefit. Um, the deal itself had to be sustainable and so Base is a layer two and in the bundling, if you like, uh, mm -hmm. the sequence of transactions, we take a tiny margin on every single transaction and that margin provides revenue and that revenue is going to be shared back with Optimism so that we can help fund retroactive public goods funding. And just for 30 seconds, uh, retroactive public goods funding, the idea here is rather than upfront paying a bunch of developers massive amounts of money and then like fingers crossed hoping they deliver something of value, we do it the other way around. So we look at the network, we look at the activity and all the, the things that have been built, and we kind of say, right, X, Y, and Z, driven huge growth, tons of users, tons of builders, lots of utility, they're fantastic, let's award a grant. And that's done through the DAO, so it's kind of a voting thing, um, and it's done through a variety of different kind of stakeholders, but it's a really solid model to ensure that economics and incentives are aligned with those who provide the most value. So quite a smart way of doing it. And that's exactly the kind of ethos that we want to continue for base. Today, base builders and base kind of projects are part of that retroactive public goods funding. So if you built on base, you can apply directly through the, the normal optimism links. 
Uh, but in future, we're going to continue to drive similar types of initiatives specifically for base where we'll include optimism builders there. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I think Optimism is definitely a leader in terms of governance and also in terms of uh, funding public goods and championing it. So it's it's good to see two awesome teams collaborating. And uh, my intuition these days is uh, Optimism is no longer just the OP mainnet. It's actually the super chain. And, you know, that's quite the shift from where we were a year ago. Uh, but it feels very intentional uh, by you and the Optimism team. So. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about the vision of the super chain and what do you think the future looks like uh, in a super chain world? We've kind of talked through this already, but let me just kind of revisit a little bit. Super chain is an idea that the future isn't going to be one chain. Like that's just not scalable. The future is very likely to be hundreds, if not thousands of chains, but hundreds or thousands of chains that are all technically different is just a logistical nightmare and something that's gonna be very difficult to scale and difficult to get people to want to be part of. And so you'll see a variety of different orgs across the crypto space trying to build out ecosystems on shared technical standards. Mm -hmm. The super chain is the term describing all of the OP stack chains. So right now that's base, that's OP mainnet, that's Zora, we're like a creator platform with a ton of focus in like the fashion realm and art and things like that. And there's a couple of uh, legacy layer ones. I hate saying legacy layer one, that kind of sucks. But what I mean by that is like layer ones from 2016, 2017, who were building in a certain direction and have since realized that really all of the excitement is happening in the Ethereum realm. And so they want to kind of take their learnings and take their technology and re kind of kindle it in that part of the ecosystem. So we're seeing a number of like older layer ones uh, wind down their chain to massively reduce their overhead costs because running a chain, if you're layer one, can be really, really expensive mm -hmm. and instead deploy their technology on OP stack, for example. So the super chain is the name for all of these individual chains. They could be general purpose. They could be very specific. They could be um, any number of things. But the idea is that they're all sharing a technical standard. They all upgrade per decisions created or, or governed by the DAO. And so we can build interoperability between them and ultimately get to the point where they kind of, from a consumer perspective, operate like one big chain. And so you have one block explorer, you have one wallet, and you can use apps on lots of different chains and you can now use these all together. Liquidity piece is always gonna be the big question. Like that's probably one of the biggest things that we as an industry need to figure out. Liquidity is very fragmented. Bridges mm -hmm. are good but they're essentially creating honeypots. And we've seen those honeypots be kind of dipped into quite a few times to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and so there needs to be a better long-term solution there. Um, we don't know what that's gonna be yet, but the first step is shared technical standards, enabling interoperability. And that's exactly what the super chain is trying to achieve. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, one thing I also realize is unless you're a dev, um, users don't really care about the chain, uh, what chain they're using, or the infra. They just want to use the apps. So, you know, with the super chain, you know, all these OP chains uh, that have, you know, committed to the law chains, they can run in parallel, share infra, like valence, sequencing, bridges, uh, security councils, and, you know, that interoperability will really make it uh, so that these users don't feel like there's many chains, they don't have to switch between, and instead they can just be using the applications, what, which is what it's all about. Um, so yeah, I think, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, we're running a little bit uh, short on time here, so I'm just gonna close uh, with uh, two last questions here. So um, the first one is, uh, can you kind of speak a little bit more about uh, why Base uh, chose Kabalin as a launch partner for the testnet and also mainnet? Yeah, happy to. We are aiming for a million builders and a billion users, and we need to provide builders with the best possible tooling so that they can come in and just do their job and not have friction. And so providing high quality, reliable access to data was top of mind. And we wanted to ensure that builders had good optionality. So we were super stoked to see Covalent lean in early and integrate base and start servicing that demand. Definitely. Uh, I think at Kavalen, we also want to head to a world, uh, like I kind of mentioned earlier, where people can just use the products they love and then all this infra is abstracted away from them. So, you know, we really wanted to work with Base to make this as easy as possible 
as devel developer friendly as possible. And we also want to connect devs who build on one chain uh, to many other chains. And at the end of the day, to millions of users. Um, another thing I really found out was, uh, you know, working on Ethereum is a, is a really powerful starting point. You know, we see this with a bunch of LTs we work with. Um, but when you start working with, you know, people on a common good like Ethereum, it becomes way easier to ladder up to do other things together. Um, so, you know, we worked with you guys. We're also working with Zora mode, PGN. Um, do you feel the same way collaborating with other Ethereum aligned teams? Absolutely. Like this doesn't work if everybody builds in silos. We have to come together as an industry. We have to tackle the big problems. We have to build in community. As part of the EIP 4844, like our team was with the ETH devs, like trying to figure out how do we make this work? How do we get it into the roadmap? How do we get it into the next fork? And we're very open to collaborating with anybody building in this space. We want to kind of see that open source mentality and open source contributions. So mm -hmm. big Yeah. And um, speaking of uh, think getting people to think in an on-chain native way um, and getting devs to build you know, apps as smart contracts, um, what are some of the ways that uh, Base is thinking about this and um, potentially how can Covalent help as well? So we are pretty early days in our journey here. Like we've been running for a small number of months. And so we're learning quickly. Ultimately, we need to provide the right incentives, provide the right environment and provide the right distribution to try and attract developers. But we also need to kind of give them the opportunity. So we need to think about kind of how we make this the best place to build. And then we need to think about how to enable that building and change behavior in some way, shape or form. So some of the things that we've been trying, some of the things that have been working are kind of smaller hackathons, event mm -hmm. attendance, um, leaning on partners, leaning on collaborators to kind of help introduce to parts of their ecosystem and really just joining together as a community to kind of educate and inspire. And I think that's probably the two key words here. People need to know how to do this stuff and they need to be inspired to go and kind of stand up and do it. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, education and uh, inspiring them uh, is really important, especially the developers. Um, for example, you know, Kavalen does this by going to all the ETH Global events. You know, we sponsor a lot of hackathons like the Super Hack. Um, mm. You know, we spoke to lots, lots of builders at the uh, base ATX DAO meetup in Austin, and we're doing lots of content creation and guides uh, to give as much support and resources as possible to builders, um, so they can start building on chain. So I really think resources and education uh, is going to be a huge unlock and is the first step. Um, yeah. So a fun question here, um, you know, anyone who's on crypto Twitter has seen this, uh, you know, Jacob Horn from Zora says it a lot. Uh, Brent Armstrong also recently retweeted it. But uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Jesse's phase, uh, phrase, on-chain is the next online? I think it's great. It's such a perfect way to sum up kind of the, the stage at which we're in. Mm -hmm. And I think even just the word on-chain is a great indicator online was hyphenated for a long time because it was this obscure term that people didn't really understand people weren't actively using the internet every single day just like people generally aren't actively using blockchain they aren't actively on chain every single day and so we're in that phase where we're kind of moving away from this hyphenated obscurity into something that's actually adopted and useful to lots of different people and so getting rid of the hyphen as a first step and just saying on chain is, is awesome. And the sooner we see on chain in the dictionary, the better, but on chain is the next online or on chain is the new online. Like it's just a really slick way of summing it up. So massive high five, Jesse. Um, he's coined a few pretty, pretty gnarly one liners. And I think that's yeah. probably my favorite. He's good at that. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, I feel like it's been a rallying call, um, for the whole space the past couple of months, uh, all thanks to you guys. Um, so yeah, as we kind of close off, um, I just wanted to ask a final question. How would you define success for base and Coinbase, uh, in five years time? Oh man, you're going to make me say it again. I've said it like 400 times this time. So I apologize to everybody listening for saying the same thing a million times. Blame David. Success is a million builders and a billion users in the next kind of two to five years. That's what we need to see. We don't care if it's on base or if it's just broadly in the crypto space. If the crypto space expands by that order of magnitude, we as an industry will survive for in perpetuity, which I think at this point is a certainty anyway. 
but we'll enable everybody in this space who has dedicated the past year, two years, five years, decade to really thrive, to really mm -hmm. bring real business to market and to really provide the utility that we know this tech stack can drive. So it's gotta be million builders, billion users. Yeah, I just wanted to hammer the point home, uh, but I think it's great because, um, you know, I love the million builders part because, you know, base is, and covalent is a bet on builders, right? And builders downstream creates more use cases and which downstream uh, brings on the 1 billion users. And I love how uh, base you guys are doing it in a way that's open, decentralized and not coercive. And, you know, it doesn't have the same lock in as other uh, centralized uh, companies, such as, you know, the Apple App Store does where everyone gets charged uh, a 30% fee. So I just really want to echo that, you know, it's super commendable that you guys, you know, as a public company is able to innovate um, to the degree where you're able to launch an incredible experiment such as base um, in the public sphere. And, you know, no one asked for it. Uh, you know, you're doing everyone a favor and, you know, it's something that no one really anticipated as well. So um, I think it just makes the fact that you guys have launched this experiment that has been going super successfully, um, you know, in a very uh, critical and, you know, environment where, you know, you guys have a lot of analysis because you're a public company. I think that just makes this whole initiative uh, even more impressive. So a uh, huge kudos to you guys as a whole team. Appreciate it. We're just getting started. There's a ton of work to do. It's way too early to celebrate, but we're determined to build the right way, build in community and help scale Ethereum with everybody else that's committed their time and resource to, to this space. Awesome. Uh, we're up on time now, so uh, let's wrap up. Rowan, it was amazing having you on the show. Thanks for joining us and sharing your views. And also, uh, we never got a chance to thank your team for the base Genesis Builder NFT. So we also really appreciate that. And we're super grateful to be a part of uh, the base builder community. So thank you. No, thank you. We're mega grateful for your time, for the early commitment to build on base. It's been a ton of fun chatting. Uh, and yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it.